Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a little guy. Hey, all, welcome to Knox Ridge, June to turn the music off. Oh, okay. I already did it. Okay. Stay here-ish okay. and make sure you keep us on the screen. Okay. Okay. Then do... Yeah. I got it going. Bye. 
down and don't believe anything you say, right? Cool? Okay, you can lose something because they were true, they happened to us in real life. Now, are you ready to make some money? Deposits 
That's not a good thing. You need to separate those two out. Your bookkeeper's gonna love you for it. Your CPA's gonna love, it, love you for it. You're gonna love yourself for it at the end of the year. Keep those accounts separate. So with First Bank, we have three checking accounts, okay? It's the first checking account in the, the flyer. It's called First Rewards. Um, you don't even have to come to the bank to see me. Call me, email me, text me. I'll get the information from you. I'll need your basic name, rank, and serial number. I'll need a copy of your driver's license. And if you've listened to Whitney and you've had an attorney draw up your paperwork, your LLC, or whatever you have for your business, I'll need a copy of that. You can email that to me. You can drop it off. I'll get the documents together. I'll bring the documents to you to sign. So we're a new type of bank where we give concierge service to the depositor that has a dollar in their account or the depositor that has 12 million. You're still gonna get a person and that's me. So again, I'm Robin Hart with First Bank. So happy to be here. Thank you and I'm gonna turn it over to Ed Gibson. I'm Emma Gizzi, I'm a DK inspection, I'm a residential property inspector. Uh, among the other services we provide is radon testing, mold testing, uh, in some situations, septic tank inspection. Uh, a new service we're getting ready to roll out in July is enhanced well inspections. So if you have any properties or are looking at buying any properties, we're going to be working in conjunction with Well Garden, which is a warranty company. They can put a warranty on the well system, provided it passes the inspection. And the average well, when it, you go to turn on the faucet and there's no water, you're looking on average at two to five thousand dollars to get the water restored. Uh, well Garden will cover that to fix that cost, even if it comes down to building the well. So that's our newest service we're going to be rolling out in July. So if you'd like any more information about it, just get with me. We've got some cards in the back. If any of you have got any general questions, perhaps on a property you're thinking about buying, give me a call. I'll be happy to come out and look at it. You know, it wouldn't be a full inspection or nothing like that. If it's close by, and I'm driving by, I'll come out for free and move. <laughs> so anything I can help you guys do is just me. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Y'all, make sure you get your car because it's going to be, especially if you've never bought a place and you've never seen a cracked foundation or you've never seen, you know, windows falling in or out or you've never seen some of the weird things that Ed and I have seen. But if you have a pool, please warn him where the pool is because he will take a dive in the middle of an inspection. <laughs> Unscripted. Okay? So. Yeah, he's got to test the waters. Good one. Boom. Anyway, back on track here. If anybody was asking, I, the attorney that I recommended was Evan Anderson with Blue Ridge Title Group. He's out of Morristown, and I probably have his phone number here. I'll find it on the slides while Kendra is talking. Awesome. Now, Kendra's here. She's got our market update. Anybody wondering what's going on with real estate? There's lots of things happening in the world. There's lots of Good things, bad things, fake things, and hidden things. And Kendra is here to tell us all about it. Y'all ready? Woohoo! Woo Come on up, Kendra. Uh -oh. There you go. It's all good. Everything's cool. Hello. Okay, you put this right here. We're going to do some of the Are we still looking up everybody's nose? You're looking right at my chest right there. <laughs> is that a better angle? I think so. Yeah. Tyrone, come on in. So detailed of the Knoxville metro area about where we're at with housing, with for resale, so for new construction, for rentals, uh, the demographic details about, and just kind of a good pulse on how the market's going. So a lot of the things that we're going to talk about is going to be in this report. You're welcome to look at it, and then some of the slides that we'll have up here, uh, you can take a picture of the link, and you'll be able to have your own access to this as well. Uh, we are, if you are curious, you can come through this 40 pages of data. It's real fun, and um, I enjoy it. Most of you guys probably won't like it. <laughs> so, uh, for the market update, 
because everything that I've tried to focus on is having affordable options for people. So what my general rule of thumb is, if we buy it and fix it up, I still want to be able to sell it below the average sales price. And that's just one thing that we're focusing on. But that kind of makes it super hard for me, for my typical way of investing, to find deals right now. And that's why we've been getting into other creative ways of doing things. But so you can let me know what you're looking for. I just told you what my buy box is. But if you want to let me know what you're looking for, it helps me kind of figure out what you're looking for. If there's any off-market deals, I can let you know. If there's any way of knowing what stats and what information you want to know, that's helpful as well. Uh, you can take a picture of the QR code, and it's just a quick questionnaire, and it has, I'll ask your information and what you're looking for. Um, so I can get to know you guys better, because I only get to talk to a handful of you guys every month, but I'm excited to be able to look at a larger scale of what people are wanting to buy. So I uh, this evening I 
just wanted to actually update all of you as to what my trajectory has been like here in Knoxville. But before I get started, I just want to ask all of you, how many of you would consider yourself to be new to Knoxville? Okay. Um, so I, I happen to be one of those new people as well. We moved here not quite three years ago. And uh, one of the reasons that I moved here, uh, or I should say the reason that I moved here, was to bring my kids to the Christian Academy in Knoxville. We moved here specifically for the school. Uh, we came here from Wisconsin. And, uh, and so there's a few points that I really want to share with all of you here today because I came here and never really been to Knoxville. I grew through a long time, probably 15 years ago, but never spent any time here. And when I made the decision that I was going to move here for my boys, then I just said, I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do in Knoxville once I get there. And uh, didn't know exactly what that was going to look like. And uh, I have, I got a little cheat sheet right here. I have done 20 deals uh, in less than three years, and uh, I could have done a lot more. However, uh, one of the things that was important to me, and some, some of the points I want to go over with you, was that my vision says I don't want to be that busy. I, I'm not out there working really hard and hustling all the time. I'm a father to my kids. I volunteer at the school where we're involved in our church. And, um, so I probably only spend about five hours a week when it comes to real estate and real estate investment. And uh, so I want to talk to you about the importance of vision. I want to talk to you also then about the importance of networking because uh, it was a group like this here that helped me to get up and running. Um, kind of being a new guy coming into the market not knowing anybody, I had to be able to tap into others. And then another thing that uh, Kendra touched upon was just the power of mastermind. And when you find yourself in a situation and you don't really know what to do, it's sure is helpful to be able to network and be able to bounce ideas off of other people who have already been there. So uh, three points that I'm going to try to make for all of you here tonight is the power of vision, the power of networking, and the power of mastermind. Now along with that, I want to really just talk through my deals. And, and I'm hoping that you can get some nuggets as I go through my little cheat sheet right here. And uh, just this is really just a help me remember the deals that I have done. But, uh, you know, we came here uh, in July of 2020. I mean, it's COVID, it's in, it's, we're right in the middle of it all. And we are looking for a home for ourselves and uh, trying to find something within 15 minutes of the school that would suit our family's needs was a challenge. Inventory was low then. And, uh, you know, and it's done nothing but get worse since that time. But we went around and we were searching for a house. And I'll tell you, one day when I was with my real estate agent, and I, and I should tell you, I called ahead. I went online and I just said, hey, I want to be a good agent. And I ended up getting a referral for a guy here at the local market. And I've been working with him ever since. Um, I've been doing enough stuff to where I, I have two agents right now, but it was a referral from other investors who had given me this person's name. And that was how we got connected with him. But I was getting so frustrated with trying to find a house that one day I made offers on um, two houses in a day. And he said to me, he said, well, what if you get them both? I said, that's fine. I'll just keep the other one as a rental. i got to get something. And, uh, and so he knew at that point that I was willing to also buy other stuff. So we ended up buying the house in Farragut. And then shortly thereafter, he said, are you interested in another one in Farragut? And there's one I think is a good deal. And... Uh, I actually went a little bit against what I typically do, and that I was paying a good bit more money, but I could already see the writing on the wall that here's a new guy coming into town. Farragut seemed to be a really hot place, things were moving very quickly, and long story short, I was only living here for a month, and I bought my first rental property in Farragut. And uh, I do not, and I've owned rental properties in the past, I do not like being a landlord. And so I needed a property manager and, uh, because it's just not something that, today I think I know enough to be a good landlord. I, I have enough experience, but I'm not a good landlord. It's just not my personality. And so through networking and asking around, I was referred to an awesome property manager here in town who now 
uh, is managing our properties for me and taking care of everything. And I love just getting something new and just saying, here, there's another one, and then I don't have to do anything except collect checks after that. But the point that I want to make with that is it was through networking at just coming here. In fact, um, the referral actually came out of this room. I don't know, has anybody ever heard of Katie Linkus with Freedom Investment Groups? Is that, uh, it, was, it was at this meeting sometime back that somebody had given me her name. And uh, she's doing a fantastic job of watching them just grow the property managers. But the point is coming to a place like this is where I was able to get that information. Um, I started uh, doing some marketing. And I said, well, I, I've got to start doing something to make a living. I just put my boys into this expensive school and I've got to start making some money. And uh, I'm not one who likes to do a lot of mailings and things like that, but I was doing some mailings. And then I got a phone call one day from a guy who had a mobile home in Maryville that he wanted to sell. And I, I'm, I'm getting better. It was Maryville when I first moved here. <laughs> and uh, I'll start with Maryville. And uh, I remember calling my real estate agent, told him I was interested in the property in Louisville, and he said, what? And I said, Louisville, he's, I don't work in Kentucky. I said, okay. <laughs> but, uh, so there was this uh, guy who called me up, and he had inherited a trailer from his brother. And his brother was a contractor, and he had all kinds of tools and everything. And so this, this trailer is filled with all the tools. Uh, the trailer is okay, it's in a mobile home park, but I had, in, in my entire career, I've been investing now for 25 years, I've never bought a mobile home before. I knew plenty of people who did, but I didn't really know what to do with a mobile home. It just wasn't where my experiences were. So again, reaching out to and being a part of a community like this and asking people what you do, how do you handle the situation with the mobile home park, and, and what you do. To make a long story short, I ended up buying uh, the mobile home and the entire estate uh, for $8,000. And uh, the, when I say the entire estate, I'm talking about all the furnishings, all the tools that you can do as a contractor. Um, my boys and I, we ended up having a garage sale to try to sell everything. And there was one weekend and we sat there and out in this mobile home park just selling and selling and selling and selling. Uh, we were just driving as much traffic as we could there. We were wheeling and dealing. And uh, I think at the end of that weekend, we ended up selling the last of the stuff. Um, I, there was one guy who came on up and I was, he was looking at something. I said, well, if you take that, I'll give you that, this, this, and that. And I didn't want to take anything with me. I was just trying to bundle it all up. But we sold thirteen thousand dollars. We sold all the, the stuff for thirteen thousand dollars, and I had somebody who came on out and bought the trailer from me for thirteen thousand five hundred. And so we did that in a in a weekend with uh, just being out there and, and hustling and getting that done. But we were just sort of cutting our teeth here in this market. I didn't know a whole lot about it. But after spending some time in that mobile home park. I was like, no, these people are really cool. Um, this looks like it's a great money-making opportunity. I, I bought a mobile home park. And uh, I think I bought the worst, and I now also learned, it's not Blount County, it's Blount County. But uh, I, I had to learn, but I think I bought the worst mobile home park in Blount County. And I, uh, about three weeks before settlement, I actually went back and renegotiated the deal and said, I'm not buying it until you evict everybody. I want, the, I want it completely vacant. I don't want a single one of the tenants in that park. Um, and it was a small one, but it was really bad. And it was just deplorable. And uh, long story short, it was just a lot of drug problems and everything in there. So we ended up having every single person evicted from the park. And I just started over. And even after we evicted them, they were still coming back and squatting. And we had to get them out. But we decided then to just start tearing down the mobile homes and we were building brand new houses on top of the mobile home frame. So we were going all out with really nice tiny houses. And so we're still in the process of finishing that park off, but we're, uh, we're more than 50% done with rebuilding it. And my goal is to make it the nicest mobile home park in Black County. And so uh, those are a few of the things that I've done. Uh, I uh, am networking with some other investors in the area. I, 
uh, have been able to do a, a couple of loans for people. Um, I've uh, done about five hard money loans in the area so far. Um, I did, from the same mailings that I got the mobile home park from, I was able to do uh, buy a house in the 21 zip code up around Pleasant Ridge. I uh, bought a house there, did a renovation. I uh, bought it for 185 and we ended up doing the renovation. I sold it for 289 um, I made the, the net profit on that was about $65,000. But one of the things that Kendra brought up was that inventory is just really low. And sometimes the better way is to go out and create more opportunities. And uh, while I have had, I have done two fix and flips, and then I'm doing a mobile home park, I decided to shift gears and start buying land and building houses. And so I have, uh, I have two houses on the market right now. We have built and sold five houses uh, so far, all of them down in Maryville. We have, uh, are working in the price points of the two that are on the market right now are six seventy nine nine and seven nineteen nine. Um, the last two that I just sold in the last forty five days, we sold one for six hundred sixty five thousand and one for seven hundred seventy nine thousand. Um, I will just tell you that that has been treating us really, really good, and I'm going to talk about some of the things that Kendra brought up. Um, the we are going all in. The $779,000 sale, uh, I was all in at around $600,000 for that one. Nice paydays. Um, the one for six sixty-five, dollars we were all in at four eighty dollars something. Our buyers are coming from California, Michigan, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, New York. Um, that they're just... Let's see, I've had offers, and a couple of those cases I've had multiple offers, and they're coming from, they're all from out of state. The renovations that I did, I told you about the one in Pleasant Ridge, 2-1. Uh, I had listed that house and that one of the new construction in Maryville at the same time, exact same day, we had two houses listed. The one in Pleasant Ridge at a 2 89 price point had uh, three offers on it. All three of the people were local. The same weekend, I listed one of Maribel, new construction, and I had three offers on it. The, the three in Pleasant Ridge all had financing contingencies. The ones in Maribel well, were all out-of-state buyers, and they were all cash. None of them had financing. And and so one of the things that I want you, and hopefully it's a nugget that you can take away, if you are doing nice houses in the six to $700,000 range, interest rates are not affecting the sales of those houses. Our buyers are not getting loans. They're paying cash for these houses. Um, of the last, uh, the last one that I did do, the one at 779.9, they put 50% down. They were fully capable of paying cash, but they didn't want to pay all cash. But they put 50% down. And uh, so that price point seems to be somewhat insulated to what is what's going on as far as interest rates are concerned. It is the locals who have been living here all their lives who want to buy a $250,000 house or $300,000 house that are being more affected by the interest rates in the upper end. So there's something to keep in mind. But the, the idea of going out and creating inventory, I think, is, is something worth seriously considering. If every single person in here went out and just started building houses, there's still not enough. There's not, we, we are not going to be competing with one another. There are so many buyers and so much need for inventory that there's enough opportunity for all of you. Where, it's going to come, where the, the issue is going to come into is buying lots. And uh, you know, lots are not that easy to come by, but here's the beauty of it. And uh, in a number of these cases, uh, of my new constructions, I did get good deals on lots, 
But the majority of them, I paid full retail. I don't even need to go out there and find a good deal on a lot. I just pay full retail for a lot, build a house on it, turn around and sell it, and make six figures. And so it takes a while. I, it, I've built some houses in the past, but it's taken me a lot longer to build them here than it has in the past. But the paydays are still good, the market is still forgiving, and the buyers are coming in and they're paying cash. So these are uh, just some of the things that I want to share with you as far as what I have done. Um, Chris had asked me at the beginning, you know, where am I getting deals? And I said, you know, one of the places I'm getting them is from MLS. And, uh, and he was like, really? How are you getting them on the MLS? Well, of, of my 20 deals on here, nine of them came from the MLS. And so I'm just watching. I, I just, and I don't even have access to the MLS. But uh, I, my one real estate agent sent me land leads in uh, the areas that I'm looking for. So every single time a lot or something is listed, I can just get it and get it in my email. And if it looks good, I just move on it right away. And I will tell you that uh, one day, two lots came up in Hardin Valley. They were twenty-five dollars to $35,000. I said, I just called him. I said, start writing the offer. And he said, well, do you want to see them? I said, well, start writing the offer. I'll go out and take a look while you're writing the offer just to make sure that, that there's something there. But um, I said, uh, you know, full price will settle right away. And uh, long story short, one of them was really, really steep, and it, it was a terrible lot. $25,000 in part of Valley, I still bought it. Um, the other one was uh, $35,000 was a much better lot and a larger lot. Uh, the $25,000 lot, I sold it two weeks later for $38,000. And I was grateful because I didn't want to build on that one. But someone else was like, I love that lot. I want to be really creative. And, um, but the point is $25,000 in part of Valley is cheap. Yeah. It's really cheap. And so I didn't hesitate to buy it. I knew somebody would pay me more for it. And then the other one, I just uh, flipped it for 45000 And I uh, am lending. This is a guy who's building houses for me. I decided to flip the lot to him. And instead of me working with him and him building the house for me, I'm lending him the money to build the house. So he's going to go into business for himself. He bought the lot. He's going to build the house. And he gets to make the profits and I get to earn interest to it alone. <coughs> so, um, broad spectrum, I've done, you know, everything from rental, mobile home, flip, a mobile home park, uh, some loans, new constructions. Um, I have flipped one, I have flipped four lots right now. Um, uh, two properties I bought at auction. And I went to an auction out uh, in Lenore City. It was a waterfront property. And I ended up buying a lot. I feel like I bought the best lot of the day. It was a 55 acre parcel that they had broken down into uh, 11 different lots, all of them waterfront properties. And I bought a really, really sweet looking lot. Um, and then I flipped it. And I was mad at myself because I wanted to keep it. <laughs> and uh, uh, the guy who bought the lot next door to me, he called me. And, he said, hey, I wish I would have bought another one. And I was thinking, well, I wish I would have bought another one, too. And, uh, but then he, he said, what would it take to, to just buy that one from you? And uh, he just came to my house that evening, wrote me a check for $20,000 to just assign my interest in it to him. And so I did it. But the beauty was, a month and a half later, the car next to it was being auctioned off as well. And five acre lots on the water, and instead of buying just one, I bought 20 acres the next time. So I have 20 acres on the water in Lenore City right now that I have purchased. There was a house on that property. So I have already <coughs> sold the house. Uh, I'm subdividing two acres and the house off. And I'm just going to share you my exact numbers. All in. 20 acres of waterfront property and a house. Hold on. $398,000. And I'm selling the house and two acres for $225,000. So I'm keeping 18 acres of waterfront property for $170,000. 
I don't know how many of you have been out looking at property, but you don't find that around not it's 20 minutes from uh, my boys school and so to be that close to Knoxville even to just have 20 or 17 18 acres for 170,000 in that proximity is almost impossible let alone water run. so um, it, it's it's just getting out there and doing things but I will you know offset much of my expense of buying that just by selling the house off and the house is a fixer upper um, but two acres uh, uh, with a fixer upper house for $225,000 in Illinois City is a pretty good deal. That matches the numbers that Kendra said that investors are, the average price that investors are paying today for their fixer uppers. Um, I will tell you, uh, you know, one of the, where I'm at sort of with things today, and, uh, you know, I want to be here to network as well. Um, I, I really, don't want to get very busy, but I do like helping other people, and if there's a way that we can help one another, I'm interested in that as well. Um, my son, he, he wants to have his first investment property, he wants some cash flow before he graduates. He's going to be a senior next year, but his goal is to have acquired something that's generated cash flow for him before he graduates high school. And uh, uh, so if anybody knows of anything or you want somebody to be a bird dog, he's He'll go on out, he'll look at things, but the primary thing that he's been looking at is mobile home parks. And uh, he's been getting some leads on them and doing some marketing for them. Um, but Kendra has been awesome and, and being willing to talk to him and, and help him with knowledge that she has as well. But through masterminds, there's people who say, I'll help them. I have a young guy who wants to do this. Um, he's, got, he's got people who are mentoring him and teaching him and showing him the ropes. I'm not a mobile home park guy. That's not my experiences. I've, for the most part, my entire career, I, while I've done tons of things, and I own a little mobile home park right now, I'm not a mobile home park expert. Uh, I'm a flipping expert. I mean, that is that's my, I've, I've flipped over 600 houses in my career, um, but that is where my expertise are. And I told him, if there's anything you're gonna learn from me, don't do what I do. I wish I would have held on to a lot more of those houses that I flipped. Um, I wish I would have bought 10 more houses in Ferry when I first moved here, but uh, I didn't have that insight then. So, um, lots and lots and lots of different things that have uh, come together. So, I want to just talk a little bit about how a group like this helped me. Before I moved here, I was reaching out and I said, I want to establish a relationship with a good investor-friendly bank. And, uh, and I knew that getting referrals from other investors who had relationships with banks already was the way to go. And so I immediately came right to the investor community and started asking, who are the investor-friendly banks? And, uh, and I had gotten a, a referral before I had even moved here. I made the contact and said, hey, once I get to town, I'd love to get together with you work on getting some things set up. I told them what my plans were. And a long story short, within four months of moving here, I was set up with a banker, had a line of credit to be able to do the things that I wanted to do. And uh, that relationship is ongoing and continuing today. Uh, they will give me a lot more, but I don't want more. Uh, you know, my, my vision says I just want to slow pace, just do enough, I want to be available, um, not working all the time, and so I don't get too busy. Um, I will tell you, and I don't sit here, and I'm not saying this to brag, while there's 20 deals in less than three years on here, this could easily have been 60, 70, if, if I wanted it to be. Um, and I share that with all of you just to say that the opportunities are out there. And in a room like this, when you sit here and you take the cumulative resources, you mastermind, you network, um, you figure out how to put things together. Um, the deals are out there. And so I want to just encourage you all in that area. Don't hold back. You can continue to keep on doing this. How many people in here are hoping to do their first deal? Okay, so we still have a number of first-timers. How many of you in here consider yourselves to be Oh, well, uh, you're in the middle. You're working a job and doing some investing. Who's in the middle? 
Okay, how many of you are full-time investors? Okay, good bit of you, awesome. So, um, we're at all different skill levels, and the people who are in this room who are full-time investors are, my experiences are very happy to help somebody who is just getting started in the business if you're out there and you're hustling and you're working hard. If you're gonna bring something to the table, people are willing to help you. Um, understanding that they have the resources that you might need, whether it's expertise or money, you've got to bring something valuable to the table. Sometimes it's hustling, get out there, find a deal. If you can bring a deal to the table, um, I think everybody in this room will help you. And, uh, but you've got to get out there and you've got to find them. Uh, if I can come and be a brand new guy in the market who knows nothing about the market, and I have to educate myself on the market and learn the market, and can dig up 20 opportunities in the time that I've been here, you can do it too. You, you should be able to do it. And there is tons of people in this room who can help you with it. And so you get on out there, you start doing things, and you start taking advantage of the resources that are available to you. So um, I've had made great relationships with other investors. I've gotten contractor referrals. Uh, I'll tell you that um, the last time uh, that when I needed a contractor and I came here, I was specifically asking in the room for referrals. And I ended up getting referrals uh, for an HVAC guy who has just been great to work with. We've had our issues or problems with him, but what I mean by great to work with is he does a good job and he is investor friendly. He gives me investor pricing. So I have a new builder who's building a house for me right now. He just told me that the HVAC quote for our house was $34,000. And I said, uh, you gotta call my guy. And he's like, my guy treats me really good. I said, no he doesn't, you gotta call my guy. <laughs> so then he called my guy and it was $14,000. $20,000 savings, but that $20,000 is because I came to this room and asked a question. I can't hear. And so, uh, on that note, um, how many people in here are members of this group, actual members? Good bit. And if I, can I, I just want to ask some of you, what, what makes you decide to become a member? What, what would your reasons be for being a member of this group? So somebody told you that this is the group for you to join and become a member here? It wasn't quite so concise, but they said you Awesome. What are some of the benefits that you guys get? Who knows the benefits that you get from being a RIA uh, member of this RIA? Home Depot. Home Depot? So, uh, how many people take advantage of the Home Depot situation? <laughs> she, she's excited about her. <laughs> Do you Home Depot also? No, the biggest benefit for me when I joined the Maria some years ago was the, was the networking opportunity. The, the, the opportunity to be able to come in and, 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 and pick the brains of the experienced investors and be able to learn and be able to live. So for me, when I joined the Maria years ago, it was it, it, the biggest benefit for me, for me getting started in my business as an investor, was the, the opportunity to come to these meetings every month be able to network, be able to, be able to get around different contractors, be able to get around different investors at different levels, experience, not experience, and with other investors that were just like me who were trying to get started, and being able to get with each other every month and, and see where our progress was and still be able to hear the stories of the experienced investors of what they were going through and what they were dealing with and being able to pick their brain. That's awesome. And you're still coming back. Yes, sir. Um, okay. That is what I was, that was one of the points I wanted to make, the importance of the networking and being a part of a group like this and being able to come and pick people's brains um, and tap into the resources of the other people in the room. Uh, the masterminding, Kendra brought up the masterminding, being a part of the mastermind where uh, you might not even have all the experiences and everything that you need here, but when you're being involved with a mastermind, there's almost always somebody who has done something you've never done, and they got a tremendous experience with it, but when you take a group like this, and if this whole group is just masterminding on a regular basis, the collective intelligence of everybody in this group, the wisdom that comes out of this group, 
you can figure out a lot of things. And so the importance of masterminding. But uh, the one thing that I am most passionate about, I'll come back for a question in a minute, but the one thing I'm most passionate about is what I do with Lightmare, and that's vision. Because I was teaching people how to flip houses going back two decades ago. And uh, at one point, I was one of the most well-known educators in the country when it came to teaching people how to flip. And you were probably following me back then. But uh, I stopped being a flipping educator. People could get flipping education in all different places. We're passionate about helping help a lot of people become very successful at flipping. But their lives were not doing so good. They got so busy, they were so focused on their businesses. And, uh, and I just thought, that's not why they started flipping. They started flipping because they wanted to live a good life. And so uh, I really focus on helping people to develop a vision for their life and then designing a business that serves that lifestyle, which is why I can come here and do 20 deals in less than three years and do that in less than five hours a week. And I'm not exaggerating. I, I, I might be exaggerating when I say five hours. It might be less. And I'm not kidding. Um, it's, it, I don't work that much because I have really refined what my business needs to look like and putting together the, the right team and all that to do that. Here's why I bring that up to all of you, because there's another thing that we want to offer and that Whitney's going to be offering as a new benefit for everybody who is a member of this RIA. And how many of you have heard of Life and Air in the past? Okay, so not too many of you. Heard of what? Life and Air? Right there. Like Millionaire, but Life. Uh, somebody who lives an abundant life. Well, we, that one of the things that we do, uh, our, we're almost 90% of our community is almost all real estate investors who mastermind together. But we do what we call a Get a Life event. And that is to help you put together a vision for your life so that you can come back and design your business to help you live and experience the life that you want to live. Kendra's been a part of it now, and she's been experiencing it. Chris has been a part of it and experiencing it. I would encourage you at some point or another to talk to them about what their experiences are, but I think Kendra can tell you that it's been transforming for her marriage, it's been transforming for her life and for her business to be a part of something where it is vision focused. For every person, how many people in the room are members? Right, okay. So all of you right now, I can tell you that um, a new membership benefit for all of you is that you can go to any of the Life Fair events for free just by being a member of the RIA. And uh, the current members. And then your, and then anybody who does sign up then for a membership and becomes a member of the RIA and takes advantage of all the networking and all the other benefits that comes with it, the newest benefit that you're going to get is free attendance to the, the Lifetime events. And it's just because we're passionate about helping people to live and experience an abundant life. And using real estate investing as a tool for doing that. And we have been doing that and helping hundreds, thousands of people really um, to do that in return. Sometimes they're very experienced when they come in and we have to help them get their lives in order, that their businesses are doing well but everything else around them is falling apart. Sometimes people are just getting started, and sometimes they're the easier ones to deal with when they're just getting started because they don't have all the baggage yet. Um, I have two guys who I haven't even had the opportunity to speak with them yet who are gonna be new uh, for me to help them with, but they're doing 60, 60 flips a year. They own 70 rentals, they're young, but all they do is work and work and work and their marriages are struggling, they don't have relationships with their kids. And the, the thing for me that's fun is I will turn their lives around. They'll have awesome businesses and I'll turn their lives around within a year. It might take as much as two to, to unwind a lot of stuff that they did, but the, they'll be on a trajectory that completely changes everything. We'll get them down to probably working 20 hours a week and making two to three times as much as what they currently make. Um, is what happens when you have a vision that drives you. And uh, that's gonna, that's gonna be one of the keys. Now, um, I have, I just wanna put out a couple more things here and then I'm just an open book. I'm really not here to sell any of you anything. I just want to announce the new membership benefit. I will tell you if you're not a member, this is 
with, if you're already getting plus this, become a member if you're not one. It's, you know, I, I would encourage you to do that. But uh, going through just a few more things here, I did a rehab flip in um, Farragut as well. I, this, the latest deal, I was supposed to settle on it yesterday, and they had to postpone for the second time. Not my fault, but the seller's fault. Um, this was on the MLS. Uh, I buy eight tenths of an acre with a mobile home, well, uh, city water, septic, uh, for $35,000. And I can't believe I'm buying mobile homes. I've never bought them prior to living in Tennessee. But uh, what I do know is that $35,000 for a home on a lot, a home needs a little bit of work, is cheap in this market right now. It is dirt cheap. Um, I'm probably going to just keep that one for the cash flow. If, if I had to spend twenty thousand dollars to pick up the trailer, and uh, it's in fairly decent shape, but if I had to spend as much as twenty, I think I still have something that's going to rent for us. It's a three bedroom, two bath. I'll probably get a thousand to twelve hundred a month in the North City. Um, uh, but here's one, here's something I want to put out for all of you: networking. How many of you are marketing and looking for deals? How many of you find the deals that you come across that uh, it's just a little bit too much for you? But you know, it's, it's like, that. if I can get it just a little bit cheaper, I'd, I'd buy it. But anybody come across some of those where you just can't quite make it work? Here's what I want to put out there is, I'm at that point in my life where I'm the guy who's willing to pay a little bit more to do less work. Um, I'm willing to buy some of those. If you're finding those deals where, you know, you it's, it's a $300,000 ARV. It needs uh, very little work, but you know they got to get 260 or 270, and you just can't make it work at that. I want those today. Um, I'm I'm in a position right now where I really want two or three of them in the near future, and so I'll just put it out there. You can keep me in mind for those. If you find stuff that's overpriced, not above retail, I'm not willing to do that. I can I can just go by that, but you know just give me a little tiny bit. I'm, but you can't make it work, I'll make it work, and, and I'll pay you for those leads. Um, but uh, primarily, I want Blunt County, uh, West Knoxville, Lenore City, and just somewhere out, out that way. Um, you bring me stuff out there that's, uh, that, that I can be in, in the 250 range, I, I'm, I'm going to be all over those things, if, you know, provided it makes sense. But, uh, you know, keep me in mind. I'm not interested. My vision says I don't want to work that hard. So I'd rather pay more to get something that I don't have to work that hard on. <coughs> I think I put a few bucks in your pocket and I'm happy to do that. Um, if you do find good lots, I'll also pay you for lot referrals. And uh, Maryville, Lenore City, Blunt County, that, you know, that's, I, I, I will gladly pay for those um, if you can bring stuff my way. And, um, See, questions. I know she had a question over there earlier. Oh, uh, you referred to mastermind several times. This is our first visit. We don't really know what So the mastermind that I really, when I talk about masterminding, it's actually through Life and Air and, and our Life and Air community. What we do is we have masterminds. Kendra and Chris are both part of a Life and Air mastermind. And it's really just getting together with a group of people and just. I get one of you to maybe describe it from your experiences.
They're like, that's not what I'm sure focusing on. And they make sure that I'm staying on track with what I really want to get out of my life and my vision and stuff like that. So um, it, it's really interesting because it could be, mar- like you said, marriage advice and business advice and friendships. And um, one of my friends explained it as, she said, I'm paying for my friendships. <laughs> and it makes sense because they are awesome networkers and the people that are in the group are so amazing. And if it was worth just the networking and the friendships alone, it's worth it for me. Um, but I've gotten so much out of it, I can't even explain it. But it's just a, a complete like 180 from a year ago of just what I was choosing up this way. Completely shifted everything. And now, so intentional with a lot of things that I'm doing that it's the complete opposite of it. It's all over there. So. so if I can, uh, while Kendra is up here, the, so this is what we have discovered, the importance of having that vision and a life vision. It's, you know, what, why do we get into this in the first place? We get into it because we want to have a better life, not because we want our lives to be worse. Yet so many people start businesses for themselves, and then life doesn't get better. They, they might maybe make more money, but they're so busy with their businesses that everything else is struggling. Um, our primary focus, and we know this, that if things are good at home, things are a whole lot better in business. Yep. And when things are struggling at home, business struggles. Yep. And sometimes people try to cover it up and they work harder and harder in business and they start trying to grind it out. But uh, if, if I can just say, one of the biggest turnarounds for you was is in your marriage. And once you and your husband got on the same page, now the business is just, the trajectory is, if you, you, you're trying to figure out how to hold on to this now, this thing don't. It was one of those things that we were both chasing after separate things, like we're going this way, the opposite of each other. And when we had that weekend in Torrance, we were there, in Sullivan, Nashville, we went to Nashville for the um, Having those moments where I can get on the same page with my husband and realize, like, we're going out through the same thing. And I remember telling him, I said, I'm, I'm not your enemy. Like, we're not, we don't need to fight against each other. I'm honored to my opportunity. Um, but it, that struggle of business and us running, my husband's a general contractor, and him wanting to do his own thing and me doing this thing, and all of us being saying, well, I can use other contractors or I can flip houses without you. It's not good. <laughs> So just in him saying, well, I'm going to call it a real estate. It's just, it was not a big spot, but maybe helping us find unity in our marriage and realizing that we have to, in order for us to move forward in our vision, we have to be unified. And our group, like our, our first time, we said, I want to be to the group to share. He said, I want to be all the time to be a better husband to my wife. And then in January, um, just the business got super hard and they found out that he wasn't like staying accountable to that and they, they damned him. I mean, I thought we were going to have a plan we coming home and we were halfway through. But at the end of it, my husband's like, this is what I need. I need somebody to hold me accountable to that level of what I was saying I wanted. So just that unity and just having people kind of urge you and say, no, 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 you're not supposed to go after that stuff. This is what you said. And it's all up to you. You can write whatever you want. You get to choose what you're chasing after. But if you don't know what you're chasing, how are you going to get anywhere? And that's, well, that's the only thing I can explain to this life. We were chasing wrong, the wrong things, and we weren't chasing the right thing at the right time together. And I think that that is exactly what I want to go with what you were just saying right there, is that when you don't have a vision, you just pursue opportunities. And opportunities will take you in all different directions. And when one spouse is pursuing one opportunity, the other is pursuing another opportunity, the thing was they actually came up with a vision and they got on the same page. And once they did, it's just taking off. It's exploding. Not only is the business trajectory just going off the chart, but their marriage is going off the chart. And I know because I was just with them. And, uh, and I got to see Lee. And Lee was a completely different person in my opinion. I wish he was here so you, I wouldn't have to talk about it. But he was a completely different person when I met him the last time from the previous time and how he had just completely transformed and to see their relationship 
but the benefit of that, of having a vision that drives your decisions, not opportunities. And so when you have a clear vision, you know what's the right business direction to go in. When you don't have a clear vision, like, so for instance, my vision is, I want to be a dad to my boys. My schedule for the next two years, as far as what I'm willing to do as far as work, is already planned out because I have every one of their events on the books for the next couple of years, so I won't miss a single thing. And I'm not going to even put myself in that position to where I'm going to miss a game, I'm going to miss an event at school, I'm going to miss an opportunity to serve at the school, I'm not even going to put myself in that position. And so that's what's important to me. So now when somebody says, hey Steve, we got this deal, and it's going to take you, you know, uh, 30 hours a week, but you're going to make a million dollars, I say, I don't need it. I'm not going to spend 30, I'm not sacrificing that 30 hours a week because the, the cost of making that million dollars is far greater than what I want it to be. But the flip side of that is when the right deals do come along, I identify them right away. Um, I, I added up all of my profits, and I, I'm a new guy in the market. Um, it's just shy of a million dollars in profits that I have generated in less than three years of being a new guy in the market. That is something that every one of you can do. I didn't know this market less than three years ago, but I took advantage of one, having a vision, took advantage of the masterminds and the people I could talk to, and then networking with groups like this. And I just want to encourage you the value that is here. I started investing 25 years ago, and I sat in a room like this as a new guy who had never done anything. And I would go on and month after month after month, I would show up at those meetings, and I would pick people's brains. I would go to the pros in the room, the experts in the room, and sometimes I think I annoyed them, and they didn't want to hear from me because I just kept, but I was just picking their brain. I wanted to more, but I was always willing to give back. I wanted to help them. And one day, I will say this, one day I finally found a deal where it was a real deal. It was a motivated seller who was crying and begging me to take their home. And when I put that thing under contract, and then I came, and I said, okay, I think I got one. I showed up at the meeting, I think I got one. Now, the people who I was annoying in the past, they were annoying me. <laughs> they wanted that deal from me. And, and then, um, one of those guys, he said, all right, you seem like you know what you're doing. Um, let me take you out and show you what I'm doing. And then he took me out and started showing me. I mean, he had like 12 or 13 rehabs going on at the time. And he started just giving me some more tips and things like that. But I ended up working with him, found him like his next seven deals. And, uh, and he was paying me for each one of them. But those kinds of things happen when you're part of a group like this. And so all the different levels of experiences, there's a place for everybody in here. This is a team sport. You can't do this by yourself. I don't do this by myself. If I was doing it by myself, I wouldn't be working only five hours a week but I utilize other people, and I, and I want to share with you a little bit of my heart when I do work with other people. I don't work with other people just to get something out of them. I try to bless other people by giving them my business. And so when I like someone, I want them to be successful as well. Uh, I want to share something else uh, with you uh, and I'm sharing this with you because I want you to have this kind of heart. Um, my goal as a real estate investor, and I had also, uh, when I was in Baltimore, Maryland, I started a real estate investor association like this one. It was my goal for every person who I worked with to help every one of them become a millionaire. I wasn't focused on me, but I knew that if I could make every single person in the room a millionaire, I surely was probably going to be one also, just by being around everyone else. But just having that attitude, I'm going to help you. 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 And if you all came here with that kind of heart all the time, where you were going to do what you could to help the people around you be successful, everyone in here is just going to explode. And uh, But if you're coming here just for what you can get from people, it, I promise you, it, it's not going to get the same results as if you come in here willing help get back to that. One other thing, uh, of course, you, know, is you did all of those deals without being a general contractor and without being a real estate agent. So a lot of people think, oh, well, I'm not a contractor, I can't build spec houses. You were paying a contractor and paying a real estate agent their fees to do their job and still making that much profit, which is awesome. So that's one of the things. And I don't think
negotiate my fees with my real estate agents or anything like that. Um, I feel that if I want them to be blessed, I want every person who works with me to be paid well because then they want to keep working for me. And uh, so, anybody have any questions for me? The world is a very small place, and what goes around does come around, and it works. You need a microphone? No. <laughs>
Uh, I'll tell you, like, if you bought me, let's just use, let's say Farragut as an example, and you bought me a house that was, you know, um, needs a little bit of work, 300,000 ARV, and you got it for, you can get it for me for 270, I, I'd probably be all over that right now. What would be more like to stay? Right? You're looking for oh, look if, I'm, if I'm looking to flip it? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm always a 65% guy. Okay. And, um, I'm new to the area, a little bit longer than you, but I just got in this business. What, um, what did you do to familiarize yourself with the market? So, uh, this I did right from the very beginning, and I'm talking the beginning of my career, and I had to repeat it when I moved to Wisconsin, and then I had to repeat it again when I moved here to Tennessee. But when I first got started in the business, and I can't emphasize this enough for anyone, um, we didn't have it the internet uh, available to look at listings and stuff the way we do today, or Zillow didn't exist. But I used to go to my real estate agent and just get them to print out listings. Now, the typical beginner investor walks in when they go to their real estate agent and they say, hey, listen, I want to buy some fixer-uppers. Can you go ahead and find me some fixer-uppers and send me the listings for that? And here's my criteria. Let me give them the criteria. And, uh, and then those investors are getting frustrated because they're not getting anything. They're not getting enough to look at. I used to go in and I'd say, give me everything. You know, this part of town. And so uh, they would print stuff out and I would walk out of there. I'd have like 500 listings. And I would feel like a kid in a candy store going through those listings. And I studied them and I studied them. I was studying the full retail stuff. I was studying the fixer-uppers. I was studying everything develop my market knowledge. What ended up taking place was I ended up knowing the market better than anybody in, in the Baltimore. And there was thousands and thousands and thousands of investors in that Baltimore market. But because I knew the market so well in the certain areas, I didn't know the entire market, but the pockets that I started getting to do, know um, when, a, when something would come available, whether it was a referral, whether it was MLS, whatever it might have been, I sometimes even knew what the block looked like. I knew exactly what the prices were, and I could move very quickly. Well, the one thing I did do when I moved here to Knoxville was I studied, and 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 I was just searching through all the listings. I was looking at what the retail prices were. Um, for the most part, all of my new construction right now is down in Maryland. And you know, I got to know that, uh, that area pretty well in the pocket that we're building in, and uh, while, I know enough about Hardin Valley, just the proximity in you know, West Knoxville and Farragut, that when I saw it lost for 25 or 35, um, I knew it was a deal, just because of, I knew what other lots were selling for. That, you know, the last time a lot sold for $25,000 in Hardin Valley was years ago, and you know, I couldn't go wrong buying it. So to have that kind of market knowledge just from studying the market, um, I. There aren't shortcuts to that. And I, I don't, uh, that's one area where I would highly encourage people is to do your due diligence, study, study, study. The more you know about it, the quicker you can move when a deal does come available. One of the advantages that I have where, in the area where I do know, uh, is that when something does come up, if you don't know it, you're starting to do your due diligence, I'm already putting it under contract yes. while you're trying to figure it out. And so knowing, your market, and uh, sometimes it means studying a number of different pockets of town, and, uh, and then eventually you get one and you land in that certain spot and you become an expert and you just stay focused in that one area. Uh, so for instance, I know nothing. You know, my, my, my world is Cedar Bluff and West. My kids go to school in, in, in Cedar Bluff. Um, I think Whitney was bringing something to my attention on the east side of town. I just don't, I don't know anything. I got a wholesaler who called me every once in a while because I got something with Strawberry Plains. I'm like, I don't know anything about Strawberry Plains. I can't help you out there. Um, but uh, I just don't know that area, so I, I just don't go there. I stick with what I know. And, uh, but if I was just getting started out here again, and that's where the leads were coming to me from, I would probably might be an expert in Strawberry Plains, and I wouldn't be looking to buy stuff in Maribor or something like that. It, it just, 
I, I tell people when you're first getting started, throw a lot of crap at the wall, and then what sticks, then you start to get really good at those areas, and you'll find that you start working more and more in those particular neighborhoods. Any other questions? successfully did a, a small development after I said I would never do it again in, in Wisconsin. And then I'm, I am doing a little tiny subdivision. I wouldn't consider it development because I'm not coming in and putting in roads, water, and sewer. Um, but I do know people who would, and uh, it's just not me. I prefer, uh, I'm lazy. I prefer easy. So, okay. uh, how long has it how long? So we have had anywhere from the best one so far has been eight months, and we've had it for 13 months. What was the question you How long has the construction been taking us? So in a, uh, I, the first time I was building houses um, in my career while I was in Baltimore, I built two houses in Baltimore, and I tried to prove both. For the record, for a guy who had done a ton of renovations and flips, um, I much prefer new construction today. Uh, new construction is a lot easier than, than flips um, from the perspective that you know what you're getting. Um, I don't mind doing a flip, but once I got the new construction thing going, the hardest thing for me to overcome was like, I don't know how to get the hole in the ground <laughs> and to get the basement and the foundation and everything. I could take a house that's gutted down to the studs and had no problem with that. And I was thought, if somebody could just build me the foundation and frame it up, that'll take it from there. It's easy. Um, and it's a prime, prime, prime opportunity in this market that we are in right now because the inventory is just so low. You can go out there and build houses and have people lining up to buy them from you. So, uh, you know, the key to uh, my uh, what I look for is lots in, I, I need to be in six, seven hundred thousand dollar neighborhoods. I'm going to share this with you, and you're going to all think this is crazy, but this is what has happened. The homes that I'm building right now are the exact same floor plan that I was building when I was in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, I started building these houses in 2013. I was building three bedroom, two bath ranchers of the basements. And I was finishing off a lot of those basements. And my uh, finished price of those houses was about $48 a square foot. I was building those homes for around $140,000. Now, keep this in mind, they were, uh, they were builder grade. And the town that I live in, we had to be a building grade. I'm building those exact same houses today and selling those for 679 here. I'm not building them for $48 a foot. Um, one, we've had to go up on all the finishes and everything to justify six, seven hundred thousand, but it's the same houses, the same floor plan that I was selling for uh, the first ones I sold for the 180s, and then I was selling for, we kept working up, we're at 239, 269, 289. 289 was the most expensive I'd ever sold one for in Wisconsin. And I can't build them for 289 or even close to that today. We're, we're, I'm spending over 400 building them today. And, uh, and so when I was talking to you about my all-in prices, that includes my lots as well. So, um, you know, the one that we just uh, did for 665, we were all in at 485. And that one, my, my builder went way over budget. I gave him some, I got lazy, I gave him some autonomy. And I said, let your wife pick the colors. Let your wife, you know, what do you want here? I said, let your wife pick them out. That was a mistake. Um, <laughs> she was putting the stuff in, and then she'd come back and say, oh, I don't like that. Tear it out. Go, let's, get, let's get this up. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, this isn't a custom house. You know, 
Uh, now I was, we were putting stuff in, paying to take it back out, going by and something else that was more designer, and then putting it back in, and uh, we probably went about 30, 40,000 over budget on that one. How the ones you built, how many of you held on to and got one there? None of them. Not, not, uh, I think the price points are just too high to hold these. Um, in Wisconsin, I did. I held a couple of them. But when I was, I was building eight to ten of them a year there. And uh, so in those cases, I was like holding on to one a year just to offset some of the taxes that I was making on those. But nothing here. I haven't built anything to hold here. Say that again. For the one that you built here. Yeah. yeah. 450 to 600 mm -hmm. is your cost price. Yeah, that's all in. That's everything. Um, that's the general contractor. That's my closing cost. That's my real. So. <laughs> the, <laughs> you <know. laughs> hey, I'll tell you who he is, but he won't work for anybody else. That's my deal with him at this point. Uh, his name is Charles Smith with Faith Rock Construction. And uh, he's. Uh, probably been here for a little bit longer than I was. So when the two of us connected, um, his ability, you know, being licensed and his ability to build a house along with my expertise and having done it before and being able to bring the resources to the table, it's been a good partnership. But um, I told him, I'll just be a lender from here on out and then your wife can do whatever she wants to do with your money. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard, but it just was popular. So, the ones that we're doing right now, um, we are right around 3,400 square feet of tenant space. I am doing, um, uh, there are 1,800 square foot ranchers on the main level, and then we're doing full basements, fully exposed with you know, nine to 10 foot ceilings, and we're finishing off in the basement. So by the time we finish with them, there are four bedrooms, three baths, full family rooms, perhaps an office or a media room, and uh, for that, if I pulled a lot and everything out, that house I could probably build uh, with higher end fixtures in the 350 to 3, and 350 to 360 range. And if we want to come back and peel back on the fixtures, so we can still build that house probably around 300. But we'll, we'll put a dresser in a piece and stuff in there. Um, we did have one. The one that I just sold for $779 was much more like a custom home. And uh, Blount County uh, had approved us for our septic permit. And then when we uh, were getting ready, we started digging the hole and we told them we couldn't put in the house that we wanted to. And uh, the inspector kept on telling us that because uh, we were putting in a basement, it was affecting our septic field and some cut bank thing. And then we went back and forth. We said, well, I'm not approving it, you got to do something else. So I just went online real quick and bought a different plan. And it looked like it was simple, but it wasn't. Um, and, and it was a lot of square footage. It was an incredible house, absolutely spectacular house when it was all said and done. Um, but uh, after we got going and uh, the inspector came back out, then he looked at it and he said, oh, you were right. You could have built what you wanted. Um, <laughs> So I, I said, would you like me to bring your neck back? Yeah. <laughs> <Or like. laughs> so, and then he, and he said, trust me, I've been building. I said, so have I. I've built this house many times before. I know what I'm doing. He was like, I know what I'm doing. for a week ago, and I've done this for people many times in the past, uh, how to 
about 80 percent, 75 to 80 percent of the value of the finished project will be the total loan. Um, if you're purchasing a renovation in the house, um, that's going to be 75 to 80 percent of the purchase price of the building. You have the time to purchase. If you're buying a lot, it'll be 75 to 80 percent of the lot. You do have to come up with down payment money. Now, one of the things that we have always done in the past, we've structured it, and uh, I'm going to share a trick with you, and we'll see how the banks are but every banker I've ever worked with actually endorses this. Um, I'm going to draw it on here so you have a visual because these numbers make sense to me, but you might not get it. I want to get round numbers. Um, let's, for argument's sake, uh, say you're, you're buying a lot that is $100,000 and you're selling it out for $500. And everything made 
made sense that they would be willing to do that. Instead of only going in and asking for 330, I go in and I ask for more. If I get my construction done at 250 and I ask for 270, not only did I cover my construction, but I can recoup my $20,000 that I put into the deal and keep, keep my money in the bank. Um, and the right environments, and once you start to develop relationships with some of these smaller community banks, some of them will even, you know, this number's great, yes, you know, just ask for 270 for construction, and they might even finance your interest payments. Um, I've had banks who would do that before, where they said there's plenty of room in it, we're just going to have to your interest payments and we'll just pull that out. And so I've done deals where I never had to make a single payment on them. Um, I just called up the contractors to get the job done, done by done, call my real estate agent, list it, agent lists it, sells it, and I just go pick up a check and I never get a payment on that. Um, and the entire construction area was funded by, from the, the draw schedules of the bank. And so learning how to structure things did I, I mean, do I still have everybody understand where I'm going with this? So I'm doing a good job. Everybody's not in their head. Sometimes it is, there's other people that I'm trying to do this. But um, using, and my goal is I like to have a lot of cash in the bank because it makes me a really strong investor. And I use it sometimes to buy properties to get into them real quick. But my goal is always how do I get my money back in my bank account? Or I'll use it and I'll put fifty or a hundred thousand dollars down on a property, but then how do I recoup my money as quickly as I can? And if if the numbers make sense and I can add it into my loan, because at the end of the day, if I add in another twenty here and and the bank is lending me three fifty, they're still only at seventy percent. And that's a fantastic loan for the bank. They are very comfortable with that. And so these are just some you know, strategies of knowing how to structure your deals the right way so that if you do have to put money into them and then you can pull your money back out along the way, sometimes uh, sometimes you might need that money anyway. Maybe you owe a budget and it's nice that if you put a cushion in there. If you only ask for 250 and it costs you 270, then you get hard if you don't have any of your money left in the bank. And so when you are going to utilize bank money, if you're, if you're already borrowing, borrow to the point where the bank is comfortable. You know, it's as high as you can go. And, uh, you know, I'm the person who's against debt. I don't really like having debt. But my philosophy is if you're going to borrow, borrow. Don't, don't be. And so some people who have this philosophy of they don't want to have debt, they try to borrow as little as they can. And that gets them into more trouble because they didn't get enough. So even when I do loans, you ask me if I would do loans. When I do loans for people, I prefer to give them more money to make sure that they're solid. Because I know that if I make them broke and I take all their money out of their account, that my deal is compromised. I would rather lend them everything that they need and let them keep their money in their account so they can cut around in the stage or make their payments to me than to drain their accounts and leave them.
So I, I know not too many people have heard of this before. Not that long ago, I was, I was at a real estate, uh, I went to a conference, a real estate conference, and I was wearing, I was wearing a shirt, and people came up to me and they're like, that's an awesome book, I love that book. And we were just sitting there and we were talking, and then, uh, and then they said, so what do you do? I said, I wrote the book. <laughs> This book took me uh, about nine years to write because I wanted to get it right. And uh, I would say to everybody in this room who is a member, uh, we'll get a copy of this tonight. And anybody who isn't a member and signed up to be a member, you'll get a copy of this tonight. And you'll also get free admission to any of our Life Nerd events. So we do two different events. One of them is called Get a Life, and that is for developing your life vision. And the other event is our Business Builders event. And that is how to now build a business that suits your vision uh, for the life that you want to live. And it's about transforming your business so that it's a business that serves you. So one of the things that we always say is that a lot, a lot of times people build their business, but they give their life to their business in hopes that someday their business gives them their life back. And we flip flop that. We build a business that gives us life. And, uh, I want to add to this that I read the book before I met Steve and I was able to write my vision statement and y'all know I told you last month that I've been selling some houses, I've been selling some apartments and people ask me why, why do you do that because I want to tell you that our goals are different, our vision is different, but goals and vision are different, okay, the goals you make for yourself might not be what's on the vision, and when you work through the book, you work through the get a life weekend, you go to the business builder weekend, you do all those things, suddenly your vision becomes crystal clear. So when you ask me why I'm selling my stuff, it's not because I'm broke, it's not because I'm, you know, going crazy, which might be true, but it's not any of those things, it's because these properties don't fit my vision. Just see my little dude here earlier? All right, I can pull up my vision on the laptop. I wrote it out, I showed everybody last year when I was here. I've got a vision written out, and I woke up one day and went, oh crap, I got a bunch of stuff that doesn't fit my vision. What are we going to do? Get rid of it. So I can focus where I need to focus, right? And that's why I'm selling. Nothing wrong with nothing. I'm fine. Everything's fine. But I'm trying to, like Kendra did over the last year, refocus my vision instead of my goals, what I thought my goals were, my business goals, my life goals, all those things. You know, I've got a vision, and i got a plan. And like Steve said, I don't want to miss any of these things. And those are the distractions. So we're getting rid of those so we can focus on what we need to focus on. And it's the vision. And I want to tell you all that having that typed out and that written out, and I can go and look at it, and I can pull it up for you now, and I've got little comments out beside it and everything. It is so important so that when an opportunity comes up, because there's lots of opportunities out there, but when it pops up, you go, does this check out? Is it the group that's going to hold you accountable to say, is this a distraction or a real opportunity? Am I supposed to be moving on this or am I supposed to say this is somebody else's and pass it on? So, so important. What's in this book, what this man knows and can help you learn and know about yourself, it, you can't replace it. It's absolutely amazing. I highly recommend it to everybody, and that's why we partner together to make sure that we can give this to everybody. All right, we have the same mission in that. Uh, Tyrone Sherry says he's called to serve, and on the back of the verse on it, we're here to serve you, we're here to help you, we're here to help you get to your best life ever as fast as possible. Right? That's it. I'm not here to even sell you anything today. I want to give away books and give away tickets and just get you guys to start moving in that area. Having your goal, having your vision written down is exceedingly important. I love it. I have it written in a hand copy. I wrote it on, I read the book on a plane ride to a mastermind bin, and on the plane ride back, I wrote it out in my handwriting, and then I typed it out so I can look at it anytime I want to. I love it. I love my vision. I understand somebody, one or two people in the room signed up for membership today. Yes. Who signed up for membership today? Jordan signed up since we've been here.